It is so great to hear the news of the restrictions being lifted. Great to see more and more people coming to church and being able to come as they see fit and to be together in the house of the Lord. You know what this means, of course. As restrictions are lifted, more and more people will be out and about. More and more people will be driving on the roads. The traffic will be more congested. Peak traffic. I want you to consider, I want you to imagine yourself driving down a two-lane highway, both lanes going same direction, bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, trying your best to maintain distance, and someone cuts right in front of you. As you just recover from the shock, the next thing you see is they cut again to the other lane in front of someone else. Oh, you don't know what to say. But you see them cut again and again, and then they disappear between the mass of cars. And you think to yourself, I'm so glad I survived that. But I think that car is going to cause an accident. Two minutes later, as you drive, you see that same vehicle on the side of the road with a flat wheel. What do you do? Do you just drive by with a smile on your face, sort of nodding? Do you point a finger and say, that'll teach you. That'll teach you. Do you pump your fist and say, justice? Or do you stop? Do you pull over? Do you go and help that person? See, these are the options, the temptations that we have. Which one are we going to take? The Germans have a word they call schadenfreude. It means you feel a kind of joy at someone else's misfortune. So when you drive by that vehicle and you see that person and the misfortune they had, there's a sense of little joy maybe. Schadenfreude. It's an interesting word. In our last sermon, we looked at the death of King Saul. And we would think that David, when he heard about that, would be relieved. David might even have some joy, some schadenfreude, when he hears what happened to King Saul. Or he could just simply say, that's justice. I am glad that there is still justice in this world after what Saul has done to me. Well, David is in the town of Ziklag when he hears the news of Saul's demise. Now, the town of Ziklag is right at the, at the bottom of your screen there. It is very, very south in Israel. And the battle where King Saul died was at Mount Gilboa, which is very, very north. The first arrow there points at Mount Gilboa. That was the scene of the death of King Saul and Jonathan and his troops. And then the second arrow there points right at the bottom at the town of Ziklag, which is the, the town where David was based. Remember, David spent quite a bit of time with the Philistines. And the Philistines gave this town to David for him and his men to live. The town of Ziklag was given to David. So that was his base of operations. And he and his men lived there. And from there, they went on raids against various groups. It was in Ziklag that he was when he heard the news. 
a messenger came from the top, from the north there at Mount Gilboa. A messenger came all the way down to Ziklag to bring the news to, to David. When this messenger came, he was hoping, thinking that he would be rewarded for his message. Because this was supposed to be good news for David. The enemy that he had, King Saul, who was persecuting him, who was trying to kill him, King Saul has died. He thought that he would be rewarded because this good news was good news for David. He also brought the crown and the armband that was on King Saul when he died, he brought to David and gave that to him. So he gave him the good news of the death of Saul. He gave him the armband and the crown of the king that Saul had before. And... He was explaining to David that he had helped King Saul with a merciful death. That King Saul was about to die, that he was mortally wounded, and that he asked this man, this messenger, to mercifully put him to death quickly on the spot. So for these various reasons, the fact that this would be good news for David, that his enemy is dead, the fact that he brought the crown and the armband to David, and the fact that he was the one who gave a mercy killing to King Saul. For these reasons, he was thinking he is going to be rewarded by David. Now when this man came, his clothes were torn and he had dirt on his head, which showed that he was in mourning. So he was respectful of the dead. But he had been traveling very fast and very far with this message to bring it to David. And what was, what was the issue for this man is that he had actually he misjudged the way that David would respond to this message. Now, it didn't help that this man was an Amalekite. And David, just the day before, actually two days before, David just came back from fighting the Amalekites, because the Amalekites attacked Ziglag, the city where David and his men were stationed, and they took captive their wives and children. David's wives, his, men's, his men, they lost their wives, their children, everyone was taken captive by the Amalekites. The men were so mad they wanted to stone David. They wanted to kill him right there and then. But David got them together and they pursued the Amalekites. They conquered them and they brought back all their children and their wives. And then everyone was happy again. But it was an Amalekite that now comes with this message to David. When he comes and he gives this message to David, David doesn't react the way that he thought David would. He misjudges him. Because what David does is he mourns the death of Saul and Jonathan. He goes in mourning. Instead of having schadenfreude, instead of celebrating, instead of feeling relieved, he goes into mourning. We know that this is a real mourning, that he really felt this in his heart, because this is a lament that he gives. And I'm just going to give you some of those verses. But he says this, he says, Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You see how he praises them? King Saul and Jonathan being praised, being so mighty and swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. And then he says, you daughters of Israel, weep over Saul who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. Weep for him. David didn't have to say this, people. David, if he didn't have anything good to say, he could do what your parents always told you. If you don't have something good to say, just be quiet. Don't say anything. He could have said nothing. He could have just hinted at 
Maybe some justice was done here. But he doesn't do any of that. He actually calls on people to praise Saul. This is the lament that he puts out, that he wants to be taught to the people around him. And then he says, How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. How the mighty have fallen. Words of praise, a lament from the heart of David, tells you what he really felt. David then goes ahead and he has this messenger actually executed. He has him killed. And then at the latest stage, David says this. He says, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity, when one told me, Behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. This man, this messenger thought that David was going to give him a reward of money and fame and fortune. And he, he thought he was going to be the man after that news that he gave David. But David said, the reward I gave him was death. That's what I gave him. The messenger completely misjudged the way that David was going to react to this news. This brings us now to the big question. Why did David not act in the way that he was expected to act? Why was he not happy about that? Why did he not reward the messenger with this news? Why did he not react to the news like a quote-unquote normal person? Someone who believes in payback. Someone who believes in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Someone who rejoices when their enemy stumbles and falls. You know, what King Saul did to David wasn't just some guy cutting you off in traffic. Zigzagging through traffic knowing that everyone is in danger because of what this, what this person is doing. It was much more than that. Imagine if the head of the country that you're in, let's say, Prime Minister of Canada, for some reason, has a personal vendetta against you. Maybe you dated the girl that he, that he married. Maybe you did something that was just unforgivable to him, and for some reason, he has his personal vendetta against you. You didn't do anything against the law. You didn't break any laws, didn't commit a crime, but he has something against you, and he sends a unit of the army to your house to come and arrest you. And he wants you arrested because he's going to execute you. And they come to your house, but you get wind of it, and you duck through the back door, and you make a run for it. And you're out, and you go into the back country. But the army follows you. They've got choppers up ahead. You can hear the dogs barking as they are after you. The soldiers are walking around with assault rifles. You know what's going to happen when they see you. But you're on the run. And there's loudspeakers, and they tell you, come out now. Because if we see, we will shoot. Come out with your hands up. But you don't. You keep running. You keep hiding. And this goes on for days and weeks and months. And eventually, eventually you get the news that the prime minister died. There was an attack. And he was killed in the attack. Are you going to mourn for him? Are you going to feel so relieved that he's now dead? Are you going to shake your finger at him and say, that's right, that'll teach you for coming after innocent people like that? You're going to pump your fist and say, justice. How would you react? 
How would a normal person react? A normal person, I think, would feel very relieved. They might even be happy or glad that that person has died. This is how we would expect a normal person to react. But David is not a normal person. He is a spiritual person. His relationship with God is the most important thing in his life. And he knows that Saul was anointed by God. So he knows King Saul and he executes, so sorry, so he honors King Saul and he executes the man who boasted about killing the Lord's anointed. David said to him, this messenger, how is it that you were not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of the young men and said, go execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. And David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. This was the most important thing to David, to honor God and to honor those that God honors. You see, this is why David was fit to be king over Israel. And Saul was not. David feared God. David honored God. David even honored those anointed by God. David always saw God as the real king of Israel. He saw any king that was appointed as a vice regent to the king of heaven. This is why David was called a man after God's own heart. He wanted to implement what was on God's heart. People sometimes refer to the stories in the Old Testament as a picture book for the teachings in the New Testament. What David did here was taught by Jesus in his famous Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy is what you've been told but I say to you, this is coming from Jesus. This is a teaching for us. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. People like Saul, people who are after you, pray for them. Pray that it may go well with them. Pray for their future. Pray for their health. Pray for their success. Pray for them. See, the problem with this teaching is not that it's hard to understand. It's not hard to understand what Jesus is saying, but it's hard to do. This is counterintuitive. This is not what, quote-unquote, normal people do. But we are called to be born again. To be born of the Spirit. We are called to be Spirit people. And we are given the promise that when we do this, we will prove ourselves to be genuine sons and daughters of our Father in heaven. We will resemble His likeness. The apple will not fall far from the tree. When you see these sons and daughters acting in this way, you'll say, I know who their father is. He is the one who makes his sun shine on the righteous and the unrighteous and his rain fall on the just and the unjust.
Secondly, we will be doing what is on God's heart as we push back against evil. When someone persecutes us because of Christ, they are doing evil to us. When we react in kind, we are doubling that evil. Because it's their evil against us, and then we are defending, fighting back, and it's our evil back against them. So that's evil plus evil. That gives you double evil. And that can continue because then they can fight back against you and then you can fight back against them and then they fight against you and you fight again. And it just goes on and on and on and eventually you get a kajillion evil coming from that. But when we bless, we stop that cycle of evil. We draw a line and we say, no further. The evil will stop here. That is what is on God's heart. And when we do that, we are doing what He desires. We will be men and women after God's own heart when we do the things that He desires. The objection that many people raise is say, what about justice? If we don't retaliate, they will get away with this wrong. How can that be right if we don't retaliate? They will just get away with it. That can't be right. I think we can learn from David, who trusted God. He believed that God would avenge him. That he did not have to revenge himself. He did not have to retaliate. He could leave that in God's hands. That God would deal with King Saul and that justice would be done. This is the kind of faith that God is looking for. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this example that David was for us. Who heard the news that King Saul had died, the person who persecuted him, the person who wanted to see him dead. And he was innocent of any crime or any wrongdoing. It was just a plain fact of King Saul's jealousy that was driving him. But Lord, as David did not return evil for evil. But he mourned and he lamented for your anointed that had passed away. Lord, I pray for, him, for, for that example of his to be our example. I pray for that to be real in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the strength. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would inspire us and encourage us to Love those who are our enemies and to bless and to pray for those who persecute us. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.